I want to introduce my son, Senator Ted Cruz. Thank you. Good morning. God bless the great state of Texas. And God bless the state of Israel. And God bless the United States of America. What a privilege, what a blessing to be with you this morning. Seeking the Lord God in prayer and standing together to celebrate and reaffirm our joint commitment to Israel and America, two nations, two friends, two allies, intertwined and standing together for truth. I will say this is the first time I've ever been to a prayer breakfast that became a prayer lunch. <laughs> And I'm looking forward to the prayer dinner. <laughs> I want to thank everyone here. Thank you for your commitment. I want to say to my dear friend, Michelle Bachman, we've been friends a long time. She can speak and she can pray. Holy cow, can this woman pray? You're one of the few people I know that can give my dad a run for his money. <laughs> Thank you for your leadership, and I want to say also thank you to, to Greg Abbott, my dear friend. You know, Governor Abbott, when he was Attorney General, he hired me when I was 31 years old as this baby lawyer. He gave me a position, frankly, he had to be out of his mind to entrust me with. And we have been, he has been a friend, he has been a mentor for 20 years. You know, he talked about the Ten Commandments case when we went to the U.S. Supreme Court. So that case was actually argued on March 2nd, on Texas Independence Day. And it was clear that the case was going to be close. The justices, we knew they were hotly divided. It could have gone either way. So I remember telling then General Abbott right before the argument, I said, look, if, it, if it's going south, if it's not going well, if nothing else works, just put your fist in the air and say, remember the Alamo. <laughs> and I will tell you at the argument, so Chief Justice Rehnquist, my old boss and friend was ill, and so Justice Stevens was presiding over the argument. And at the argument, Justice Stevens did something I've never seen before or since, which is he praised the advocacy General Abbott did for being particularly excellent. And General Abbott mentioned the Ten Commandments are in the courtroom. Do you know how many time the, times the images of the Ten Commandments appear in the courtroom of the Supreme Court of the United States? Forty-three. They appear twice on the doors leading out of the courtroom carved into the wood. They appear 40 times in the brass gates on both sides of the courtroom. And then, as General Abbott observed, they are carved into the stone with Moses holding the Ten Commandments carved in Hebrew. And you can read the Hebrew in the courtroom, literally looking down over the justices' left shoulders. And I got to say, everyone knew there was a real chance we could win or lose. We also knew there was a real chance the justices would cut the baby in half. And the only real question was which commandments they were going to uphold and which ones they were going to try to strike down. <laughs> but as he, as he said, it ended up both Texas and Kentucky had Ten Commandments cases that were argued back to back that day. 
And unfortunately, Kentucky lost. They struck them down. But Texas, we won. And that 5-4 decision changed the law across the country, upholding Ten Commandments monuments all over our nation. And you know, that battle illustrates how America and Israel, how our histories are intertwined back to the very beginnings of our nation and millennia before it to the beginnings of Israel. You know, I think it is worth pausing and reflecting for a moment. What is it that produces peace in Israel? Now, prayer, certainly. God's blessings, certainly. But what in the realm of man, what in the realm of what we can do with policy works? Just two years ago, as the Abraham Accords were signed, we saw a flowering of peace in the Middle East, the likes of which had not been seen in a long, long time. And it seems to me people ought to sit back and reflect for a moment and ask, why? What produced that? And how do we continue going down that road? For a long time, American leaders have embraced a deliberate policy of strategic ambiguity when it comes to Israel. On addressing Israel, they say, well, we stand with Israel, but we also stand with the Palestinians. We're with Jerusalem, but not too much. And by the way, that has been the policy, not just of Democrats, but of too many Republicans as well. They just can't make up their minds. And they think being in the middle of the road leaves you as something other than roadkill. <laughs> by the way, to our friends from Israel, if you see armadillos run over in the middle of the road, that's what happens. And if you're neither hot nor cold but lukewarm, you'll be spit out. I think that's a fundamentally mistaken view. And in my view, the way you produce peace is for American leaders to speak clearly and unequivocally. And I want to point to what I think were the two most important policy decisions made during President Trump's presidency. The first was referenced earlier this morning. It was the decision to move the American embassy to Jerusalem, the once and eternal capital of Israel. Now, the backstory of that decision is worth reflecting upon. This was a hotly contested decision within the Trump administration. Both the State Department and the Defense Department argued vigorously against moving the embassy. Both state and defense said, if we move the embassy, the enemies of Israel will be very unhappy with us. I'll tell you, I engaged repeatedly and vigorously with President Trump in the Oval Office on this question. They said the enemies of Israel would be unhappy with us. I responded, what, like they're so thrilled with us already? <laughs> Did I miss something? They argued, well, if we do this, we'll enrage the Arab street. And peace in the Middle East will be harder. And what I argued, I said, Mr. President, if you want to see peace in the Middle East, draw a line in the sand and say America stands with Israel, period, the end. Now, as you know, presidents from both parties had promised to move the embassy to Jerusalem. And presidents from both parties had broken that promise. Thankfully, President Trump made the right decision, made the courageous decision, 
overruled state, overruled defense, and moved the embassy to Jerusalem. I was there the day the embassy opened. It was the 70th anniversary of the creation of the modern state of Israel. I've been many times to Israel, many times to Jerusalem, never before or since have I seen jubilation like that day. Literally, people dancing in the streets in celebration. I remember as the embassy was being dedicated, one woman, an older woman, a woman with a tattoo on her arm who had come through the Holocaust. She looked at me and held my hands and with tears in her eyes, she said, I never thought I would live to see this day. It was powerful. I also do not think it is coincidental that the very same week we opened the embassy in Jerusalem is also the week the Trump administration announced they were pulling out of the disastrous Obama-Iran nuclear deal. And that too was the result of an epic battle within the Trump administration. Just like with the embassy, the State Department and Defense Department argued vociferously against pulling out of the deal. Both the Secretary of State and the Secretary of Defense passionately, vigorously argued against it. And again, I spent literally dozens of hours with President Trump making the case this deal is disastrous, that when the Ayatollah Khamenei says death to America and death to Israel, he means it. And if history teaches anything, it is that if somebody tells you they want to kill you, believe them. You know, there was an editorial cartoon some years ago that showed the Ayatollah saying, death to America. And it showed John Kerry saying, can we meet you halfway? <laughs> but we had a vigorous, vigorous debate. And once again, President Trump overruled his own Secretary of State and his own Secretary of Defense, made the right decision and pulled out of that deal. It was the single most important national security decision made in the entire Trump presidency. So fast forward to the end of that presidency. I'm on the South Lawn of the White House for the signing of the Abraham Accords. At that time, I visited with the foreign ministers and the ambassadors of both the UAE and Bahrain. Both of them said almost word for word the same thing. They said, it is now clear to us that America stands unequivocally with the nation of Israel. We want to be friends with America. Therefore, we will be friends with Israel. That's the power of clarity. That is the power of American leadership that doesn't flinch, that doesn't hide. Right now, tragically, the current administration is headed back as embracing the same ambiguity. It is not accidental that just months into this new presidency, thousands of rockets rained down on Israel. Immediately after that attack, I flew back to Jerusalem, back to Israel, to express America's support and solidarity for the state of Israel. But that ambiguity right now, this administration is desperately trying to undermine the embassy in Jerusalem. Now, how are they doing that? They can't close it. As much as they want to, and really they want to, 
They recognize politically that's not tenable. So their alternative is they want to open a consulate in Jerusalem to the Palestinians, which has one purpose and one purpose only, which is to undermine the claims of Israeli sovereignty to the city of Jerusalem. Simultaneously, they are right now in Vienna desperately negotiating a disastrous new Iran nuclear deal. How many of y'all know who the lead negotiator for the United States in this deal is? That would be Russia. They literally have enlisted Vladimir Putin to negotiate on America's behalf. Now, I want you to think for a second when you've got Putin and the Ayatollah sitting down. They both hate America. And unsurprisingly, the deal they negotiate is terrible for America and terrible for Israel. They are desiring to literally give hundreds of billions of dollars to a theocratic lunatic who wants to murder us. You know, when the first Iran deal was being negotiated, Prime Minister Netanyahu came and gave an address to a joint session of Congress. It's a powerful, it was a Churchillian address in its gravity, in its, in its clarity, in its force. When that happened, I participated in a discussion with Elie Wiesel, the Nobel laureate. Elie wanted it to be a bipartisan discussion. He thought it was right that it be bipartisan. I agreed with him. So we invited Chuck Schumer. He said no. We invited Dick Durbin. He said no. We went down the line inviting one Democrat after another after another in the Senate and the House, and every single one said no. So ultimately, we did the panel, Ellie Wiesel and myself, the two of us, because no Democrat was willing to participate. We had hundreds of people gathered in the Capitol. And Ellie Wiesel, having survived the Holocaust, said, when the words never again are uttered, they mean something. And right now, there is one and only one threat capable of murdering six million Jews again, this time in the flash of a second. And that is a nuclear Iran. And if we believe in never again, then we must be united in saying the Ayatollah will never, ever, ever get a nuclear weapon. I'm going to make a final point. You know, some people have asked me in Washington, how is it that a Cuban, Texan, Southern Baptist became the leading defender of Israel in the United States Senate? And I'll tell you why. One portion of it, all of you all know my dad, you know his experience being imprisoned, being tortured in Cuba. You know his experience fleeing Cuba and coming to America. And I was raised listening to stories of freedom fighters, listening to the power of when we lost our freedom in Cuba, we had a place to go to. And there are two nations and precisely two nations on earth that were formed as a haven of hope a haven of refuge, a haven of safety for those who were oppressed, for those who were persecuted. America and Israel both became and were formed by welcoming those that were persecuted across the globe. We have an intertwined history and intertwined values. And then secondly, when I was a little kid, it's actually a story I got to tell Prime Minister Netanyahu, when I was a little kid, I remember the Entebbe Raid. The Entebbe Raid, now understood through my five-year-old eyes, 
was Israel saying, you may take Israeli citizens hostage. And if you do take Israeli citizens hostage, tragically, they may lose their lives. But you know what? You're going to die. And I got to tell you, at age five, looking at that, that was a very Texan foreign policy. <laughs> there is a clarity in Israel when you are surrounded by nations who would drive you into the sea who would murder you if, you if they could, the only thing that preserves Israel is the ability to defend itself, and it's why America will stand unequivocally with Israel. We will follow the command of the word, and we will pray for Israel. We will pray for peace in Jerusalem, and we will bless Israel because we want God's blessings and not the curses that come to those who curse Israel. And so I close as I began. God bless Texas. God bless Israel. And God bless the United States of America.